Verses 32 to 35. Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. O sing praises unto the Lord. To him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens, which were of old, lo, he has sent out his voice, that a mighty voice. Ascribe your strength unto God, his excellency over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. O God, thou art terrible, out of thy holy places of God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. Blessed be God. Well, it's Groundhog Day again. No, I'm just kidding. I used that line a couple of weeks ago, but it does remind me of a, another movie from the 1980s, and you might be thinking, you know, Pastor David, you just, like, watch too many movies. And that's true. A couple of decades ago, or three decades ago, maybe I watched a few too many movies. But there's a, another movie I'm reminded of from the mid-'80s. In fact, it came out in 1986. Um, and it was not a good movie, not particularly a good movie. It's kind of dated, boring, whatever. But it had a, a running gag in the script, a, a line that kept re repeating itself throughout uh, the movie. The premise of that movie was that a, a young couple buys an older home. They think it's a bit of a fixer-upper. It's got a little few things that they can tweak here and there, but it's a good steal. It's a good buy. They get in the house and very quickly discover the whole thing is falling apart. So in their desperation, they begin trying to find contractors and plumbers and electricians and whatever else who will fix their house for them. And when they ask how long is it going to take, the standard answer they get back is two weeks. And as the repair stretched out over months and months, whenever they asked when will the house be done, it was always two weeks. Well, it's been two weeks since the, the shutdown began. Well, I wonder how many more two weeks it's going to take for the government to decide that they have stemmed the tide of, of COVID-19 in Nova Scotia. I do pray that it won't be too many two weeks. I also pray that you are holding up well during this, this time of isolation and that you are finding good ways of, of staying strong and not giving in to the despair that can infect the hearts and the minds of some people. One thing we can do as Christians, though, to protect our mental health is we pray for each other. Not just 
pray for our own little church, not just pray for our own little community, but we pray for people around the world. Prayer is what we should be doing anyway. And it always has been a help to believers in times of trouble. And as we begin to, to pray for others and, and consider the needs of others, it sometimes helps us to put our own lives in perspective. We might be devastated by what we are experiencing here in Nova Scotia. But if we stop and we pray for people around the world, we might broaden our perspective to see how truly blessed we still are. It helps us to understand the meaning of that old saying, I complained I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. While our situation is difficult for us, there are places in the world where people have it a lot worse. If you've been following what's been going on in Israel, how uh, rocket attacks have really stepped up this past month, you realize that maybe here in Nova Scotia, we've got a little bit better of a situation going on. We haven't, as Nova Scotians, we haven't had to deal with 20 years of, of rocket attacks, of, of mortar attacks. We haven't had fear of, of the unknown ruling our lives the way they have had in places like Israel. You think of Israel right now, as of the last number I heard uh, this month, 850 rockets have been launched by the terrorists against the people of Israel. Some 200 of those rockets have landed in, in Palestinian communities, killing Palestinians. But they are terrorists whose goal is to kill Jews. We think of, of the Jews there in Israel around uh, the places where the rocket attacks are coming from. The latest, the latest statistic I have heard is that half of the children there are suffering from PTSD. It's a serious situation they are facing. So what can Christians do about this? As believers in Jesus, we need to stand firm for the truth. And like Moses, we need to intervene in our prayers on behalf of people who seemed determined to take the express lane to hell. You know, a lot of us have some extra time on our hands. Let's use this time for prayer. God knows how much it is needed. As a 19th century evangelist D.L. Moody once noted, we need men and women who will stand in the gap. Let us be intercessors and pray for this world. In the end, there's only one hope for the evildoers. Believe it or not, it's the same hope that exists for their victims. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to pray and to intercede. We also need to stand firm and proud of the gospel of Jesus Christ, boldly and lovingly sharing God's truth with whoever will listen.
2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8-14 to 14. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, 
whom has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. God sent His Son. They call Him Jesus. He came to love By my power, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Yes, I know it holds a future, and life is worth the living just because He lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy. But greater still, but come ashore, this child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because And life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross the river, I'll fight my fire, the war will pain. And then there's death. See the light of glory, and I know He lives. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, yes I know He holds. Life is worth the living just because he lives. And life is worth the living just because he lives. In times of strife and conflict, the danger for the Christian is to give in to the ways of the world and to demand justice, to scream for justice, to march in the streets for justice. Now there is nothing wrong with God's justice, but too often the world wants mob justice. And at all times the church is supposed to be about mercy to begin with. 
The temptation is to return to living under the law of Moses where the the sins of the father are visited upon the son to the third and the fourth generation. One can understand the demand for justice. Things are are bad in this world. But justice is a two-edged sword. Those who want justice for others, those who look at evildoers and say they deserve justice, will also receive justice themselves from the hand of God. In my experience and observation, those who scream the loudest for justice are often the most willing to practice injustice. Think of them as being like the environmentalists who preach against the dangers of of global warming while they fly around the world in private jets. Think of them as advocates for the poor who who demand justice for those who have no voice while they themselves live in a gated community. In times like this, Christians need to be careful not to forget the goodness and the mercy that God has already shown to us. Scripture tells us to focus our minds on the good. It says in Philippians, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. The danger for the Christian church is that we allow the circumstances we find ourselves in to tear our eyes off of God, to take us away from focusing on the good. The command given to all believers is to guard the good that God has given to us, to allow no one or no circumstance to steal from us the treasure for which Christ Jesus shed his blood. How then do we guard the good? Is it the same as the command in Philippians 4, 7, which tells us to guard our hearts? We guard our hearts through prayer. We guard our hearts by refusing to be anxious about the circumstances of life that we find ourselves in. We guard our hearts by recognizing that God is with us. God is near us no matter what life throws our way. In 2 Timothy, the command to guard the good is a little different. We guard the good that God has entrusted to us by refusing to be ashamed to testify about our Lord and to refuse to be ashamed of those who suffer for the preaching of the gospel. We refuse to be ashamed of Christ Jesus. And if there's one thing our society has asked of Christians for the past hundred years or so, it is that we kind of tone down this Jesus thing. Yes, it's okay to use the name of Jesus as a a swear word. Yes, it's okay to, 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 to shout out, thank you, Jesus. But when we really talk about Jesus, when we talk about Jesus in the Bible, that's a problem. Okay, we can talk about God in in some nebulous way. But we've got to cool it on this Jesus stuff. It's okay. Most people in the world believe in God in some form or another. So we can talk about God and we can mean it our way and they can hear it their way and it's all good, right? When we talk about Jesus... We talk about the Jesus of history, the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus we find recorded in the Word of God. We are potentially insulting everyone who believes different than us. We're just going around flaunting that Christian privilege we have. So tone it down about Jesus. What else can we do? If you are a Christian following Jesus, 
You understand, Jesus is God incarnate. Jesus is the creator of the universe who came to earth, became one of us to redeem us from our sins and from the, ju- and from the consequences, the just consequences of our actions. Oh, to be ashamed of Jesus who loved us so much that he willingly faced the cruelty of death upon a cross to save our souls from eternity in hell is to reject the good that God has entrusted to believers. We can't shut up about Jesus. Imagine for a moment a person who is deathly ashamed of their spouse. And they're ashamed of their spouse, not because their spouse does something bad, but because their spouse has some goodness in them. Can we not reasonably conclude there's something wrong with the person who is ashamed? Do you remember the story of King David and his wife, Michal? David longed for the tabernacle of the Lord to be established in the city of Jerusalem. And David had brought in the Ark of the Covenant, the most sacred object in all of the Jewish nation. The Ark of the Covenant had been there since God had instructed them to build it at Mount Sinai. The Ark of the Covenant contained some of the most important relics in Jewish history. The stone tablets that God had carved the law upon were in the the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron's staff, which had had budded years after it had been cut and dried, as a sign that the line of Aaron was the right line for the priesthood. It contained a jar that had been filled with manna. And upon the Ark of the Covenant was was two angels on either side of a seat, two cherubim on either side of a seat. And that seat was symbolic of the presence of God with the people of Israel. The Ark of the Covenant was so sacred and holy that to touch it was to bring about a death penalty, not a death penalty given by men but a death penalty enacted by God. And as the ark was brought into the city, King David dressed himself in a linen ephod. Think of it as a a vest that hung down to his knees. And he danced with all his might before Almighty God. He was filled with joy to overflowing. He was glorifying the creator of the universe. And David was praising God, the God who had blessed him and had blessed the nation. And while David danced before God in front of the people, Michal, his wife, watched David from a window, and she was ashamed. She was embarrassed of her husband, that he should act in such an undignified manner. She confronted her husband, talking about he had danced, disrobed in front of the slave girls. She despised her husband in her heart. But here's David's response to his wife. When she rebuked him, he didn't take it. What he had done, he had done for the glory of God. It is for us as Christians a template of how we need to see ourselves before God. Here's what David said. It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. We cannot guard the good that God has entrusted to us if we are embarrassed by the good or ashamed of 
the good. And there is no greater good entrusted to believers than the gift of eternal life purchased by Jesus at Calvary. If anyone who calls himself a Christian is ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then they are demonstrating that there is something seriously wrong with their hearts. That somehow, even though they are called to love God, they are despising Jesus in their hearts. To despise the gospel is to reject the God of the gospel. It is to spit in the face of Jesus, and it is to demand to spend eternity in hell. In our hearts and with our actions, all Christians need to boldly proclaim that we are not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Nor should we be ashamed of those who suffer persecution for the sake of the gospel. We need to uphold those who are persecuted because of the sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't ridicule them. We don't snicker at them. We don't say they deserved it. We uphold those who are facing jail time for preaching the gospel who face hatred for preaching the gospel, who, who face even persecution and death for f- preaching the gospel, we should not be ashamed of those who are willing to lay down their lives for the sake of the gospel. The other thing we need to do to protect the good entrusted to us is to be willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Because we know that there is no deeper love and no greater truth than that given to us by Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. The Christian who is willing to suffer for the gospel, the Christian willing to suffer for the good entrusted to them by Jesus, is doing so because they are convinced that Christ Jesus is able to guard what we have entrusted to him. As we saw in our Bible study this week, it is the will of God the Father that everyone entrusted to Jesus will be saved. No one who is entrusted to Christ Jesus will be lost. We have in Christ Jesus entrusted to him our eternal salvation. Our hope is in Jesus who has promised that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. For the believer, our trust is in Jesus. He holds our salvation in his right hand. Should we then, like David, not be willing to face humiliation for the sake of the God who loves us and has promised us eternal life? This then is the challenge for the church. It's not just for times of difficulty. It's also for times of of prosperity as well. Are we willing to guard the good entrusted to us by Jesus? He died for us. Will we live for him? Of the gospel message, we are never to be ashamed. Nor do we dress it up with false doctrines to make it more palatable to the world. We know that Jesus died to save our spirits, our souls, our lives. We don't need to to say that Christ Jesus died to heal our bank accounts as well. Jesus died to make us one people, one nation, one holy church under his authority, under his headship. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. 
Why then should we accept doctrines of devils which seek to divide us according to immutable characteristics and which declare that some children, some people are guilty of the crimes of their parents and ancestors? Jesus died for all of us. Can we live for him in the truth and love he has entrusted to us in the gospel? Can we stand proud of Jesus in whatever circumstances we find ourselves? Do we rejoice knowing that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father? Do we rejoice in the gospel? The Lord Jesus has entrusted you with the goodness of the gospel Stand firm, stand proud, not of yourself. Stand proud of Jesus and hold tight. It will be worth it all. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. We thank you that before the foundation of the world, you loved us. We thank you that you have entrusted to us the gospel, the good news. Even as we believers have entrusted to you our salvation, our hope for eternity. Jesus, I pray for those watching this video. I pray for my congregation that they will stand firm in the gospel. They will stand proud of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and they will never be ashamed. I pray that they will guard the goodness that you have entrusted to them all the days of their life. Jesus, I ask this in your precious name. Amen. Birthday,